Sheldon here back with you again with CFI Pro and this week we're going to be talking about our last couple of finish up knowledge portions of the regulations and this time we're going to be talking about subpart E of part 61 and that is going to be private pilots. Well, let's start off with 61102 and that's going to be the applicability of a private pilot. So who does this apply to? Who does Part 61 of the private pilots, who does this apply to? Well, it says that this subpart, which is subpart E, prescribes the requirements for the issuance of private pilot certificates and ratings, the conditions under which those ratings, uh, certificates and ratings are necessary, and the general operating rules for persons who hold those certificates and ratings. So it tells you right here that we're going to be talking about the requirements for the issuance of the private pilot certificate, the conditions under which those certificates and ratings are necessary, and the general operating rules for persons who hold those certificates. Let's begin with our 3579 rule. If you followed on me, but followed with the requirement, let's start with our 3579 rule. If you have listened to Let's start here with our 3579 rule. If you remember through our past regulation uh, lessons that you may have seen, we have the threes that stands for eligibility. So let's start off with our 3103 and let's talk about the eligibility. So your student comes into the school and the student says, hi, I've been flight training for a while or either I have no experience or whatever the case may be and I'd like to be a private pilot. Well, because they're going to start off as a student pilot, they must meet the requirements to be a student pilot. But let's talk about what type of selling we must do to this person. We have to tell them what they're going to have to do to be a pilot. So we're trying to sell the program to the client as they come into our school and to understand the regulations is going to help us do that. So it says, to be eligible for a private pilot certificate and that means that to sit into the practical exam to sit into the FAA check ride as it's commonly known um, a person must be at least 17 years of age and that's telling me that they cannot take their check ride until they're at least 17 years of age in an airplane we don't care about gliders or balloons must be able to read speak write and understand the English language how would you know that well just sit down and have a talk with them have them fill out the paperwork to go flight train uh, ask them how ask them just ask them questions hey how's mom and them you know just talk with them and see how see if they can speak English can they write did they fill out the application did they understand the directions that you've given them if not you're gonna to have to direct them to the FISDO to get that uh, clearance from the FISDO to be able to train if you think that their English is a little bit too bad. Uh, now it does say here if the applicant is unable to meet one of these requirements due to medical reasons, the administrator must place such operating limitations on that applicant's pilot certificate as are necessary for the safe operation of the aircraft. So if a person cannot read, can they be a private pilot? Well, it says if the applicant is unable to meet one of these requirements due to medical reasons. Now, I don't know a medical reason that would make a person not be able to read, but I'm not a doctor. Uh, I do know that there are things that would make it where a person is unable to speak. Uh, I think that uh, I have known uh, about pilots who are private pilots who are who are mute and cannot speak. And they just can't go into airspace in which they're required to talk. Uh, but th it can happen as long as they have uh, something on the medical certificate that says they can't do that or write or understand the English language. So there can be medical conditions in which that actually may uh, be the case that they can get it, even though they can't do those things there. It says here in paragraph D that they must receive a logbook endorsement from an authorized instructor who conducted the training or reviewed the person's home study. On the aeronautical knowledge areas listed in 61105, we know 105 is aeronautical knowledge, that's the book work, uh, of this part that apply to the aircraft rating sought. So we want the person to be private pilot and the rating is going to be single engine land. And so we're going to be able to take care of aircraft, air, uh, so private pilot, airplane, single engine, and that's what we have to train them on. 
And so this one's a big one too. And of course, you've probably heard me say it on the past lessons that a person's home study course. Remember that a home study course is not something like Glime or ASA or King. That is not that. Home study course is defined very clearly in AC 61.65 in the very front. I think it's on page three and they clearly talk about what a home study course is and it is not what everyone thinks it is which is to uh, pay your 200 and some odd or 300 and some odd dollars and go through a ground school online and that's home study that is not home study okay home study is defined on page three of advisor circular 6165 very common that people do not know about that and it's okay because learning is defined as a change in behavior as a result of experience and without you knowing it or somebody telling you you're not going to know it okay so moving on after they have the training you got to certify that the person is prepared for the practical test so if you've got your ac 6165 out you can pause this and then come back and i'll tell you about this all right hopefully you're back with me so how do you certify that the person is prepared for the knowledge test for private pilot well you're going to turn to the appendix and you're going to give them an alpha 32 endorsement and that alpha 32 endorsement is going to say that you have given them the training or you certify that you've looked at their home study course and you uh you concur you believe you certify that you think they're going to pass the knowledge test after that they must pass the knowledge test on those areas and uh, if they don't pass it they have to get a 6149 endorsement every time they don't and they have to keep going until they pass it they also must receive some flight training and in addition to the flight training a logbook endorsement from an authorized instructor who conducted the training okay so receive flight training and receive a logbook endorsement from the authorized instructor who conducted that training in the areas of operation listed in 107 so 107 if it's got a seven on the end that is your maneuvers and procedures or the flight training that must be done it sometimes it also lists a little bit of ground portion there so you can't always say it's all uh, all in the air there is some other like 61 187 for cfi requires you to have foi training and that involves the foi training that's required to actually teach someone something in the air so it's not all uh, 100 percent uh, uh, airborne maneuver stuff okay so don't get that into your mind but it's maneuvers and procedures that's required to be taught in the airplane or for the airplane uh, and that have to apply to the aircraft rating sought so in this particular one our aircraft rating that we're going to search is going to be single engine land or single engine okay so the next paragraph here is going to be that uh, or the next line is certified that the person is prepared for the required practical test now it's kind of an iffy thing here and what they should say here what the fa should say and you can write it in your notes certify that the person is prepared for the required practical test per far 61 39 alpha six 6139 paragraph alpha is going to be the holistic view of are they required for the required uh prepared for the required practical test okay uh paragraph g says meet the aeronautical experience requirements of this part that apply to the aircraft rating sought before applying to the practical test so they must uh, have all of the flight time the aeronautical experience all of the flight time and that's in 109 so that's a nine whenever you see three eligibility five is aeronautical knowledge which is the book work seven maneuvers and procedures and nine is flight time so they must meet the aeronautical experience requirements that apply to the aircraft rating sought aircraft rating in this particular instance is single airplane single engine uh, paragraph H says pass a practical test on the areas of operation listed in 61107 if what if we turn to 61107 and we look at everything that's in 61107 Bravo and Bravo 1 would be single engine Bravo 2 would be multi-engine if we look at everything within 61107 Bravo 1 you're gonna see that's exact match of the PTS or ACS depending on what check ride you're taking you're gonna find that it's exactly what it is in this particular case 61107 of course is ACS it's not 
PTS. But if you were in 61187, which is flight instructor, of course, that would be PTS. But nonetheless, it's still going to be a 61187 Bravo 1 for single engine. If it's a, a private pilot, 107 Bravo 1, commercial, 127 Bravo 1, and even ATP 157 Bravo 1. Uh, wrapping it up here, comply with the appropriate sections of this part that apply to the aircraft category and class rating sought. Comply with the appropriate sections of this part. And that means every part, every single regulatory guidance in part 61. And that's a lot of information, which means that as an instructor, I've told you before, you have to be very, very familiar with with all of Part 61 because that is how you do your job. And so everything that applies to the aircraft category and class rating sought, you have to be familiar with and make sure that the person complies with that. Lastly, before a person can actually go take a private pilot practical test, they must either hold a United States issued student pilot certificate, a sport pilot certificate, or the recreational pilot certificate. Okay, so hopefully uh, that makes more sense here. Let's go right on down to aeronautical knowledge and let's talk about that. Now it says... Now it says here a person who is applying for a private pilot certificate must receive and log ground training, must receive and log. Do not send your student to the exam without having ground logged. If they have completed some on some at home, uh, uh, if they have completed some type of ground study like um, King or something like that, they must have their graduation certificate with them. And that still is not going to relieve you from the duty of ensuring that that person is capable of pra uh, passing the practical test, which means if a, per if a person does King Schools Online, that still does not re rely uh, relieve you of the duty of you actually sitting down and making sure they know what they're talking about before they go to the practical test, which means you're going to have to uh, break open the ACS and actually go through it with the client to ensure they know what they're talking about. It does not relieve you of that duty, and you must make sure that that's actually logged. So you got to have the ground training from an authorized instructor or completed a, a home study course, uh, which is defined in the ACS, uh, or excuse me, Advisory Circular 61.65. I think it's on page three or so, but you can find it right in there in the very first part of the aeronautical knowledge areas of paragraph B of this section. So let's look at B, and there's only just one here, just B1. Every single type of pilot, it doesn't matter what it is, a uh, airplane pilot, a rotorcraft pilot, a glider, lighter than air, they all must know these things. And that is the applicable federal aviation regulations of this chapter that relate to private pilot privileges, limitations, and flight operations to this chapter. See, this is what's so important about knowing how to read the regs. See, here it says chapter, right? But if we go to the other one, remember it said part. And then some of them actually say subpart. So what is the chapter of this? Well, think about that. If you think you know what chapter you're dealing with, post the answer down below in the notes. I want to see if you know what chapter we're actually looking at. Federal Aviation Regulations of this chapter. And post your answer down below, please. Okay, second here, accident reporting requirements to the NTSB, use of the applicable portions of the AIM and FAA advisory circulars, use of aeronautical charts for VFR navigation using pilotage, the de reckoning and the navigation systems, uh, radio communication procedures, recognition of critical weather situations from the ground and in flight to include wind shear avoidance and the procurement and use of aeronautical weather reports and forecast. And that doesn't mean you look down at your fore flight and you go, green balls mean go. That does not mean that. Okay, so you got to understand weather. You just can't go into this blindsidedly. Number seven, 
safe and efficient operation of aircraft, including collision avoidance and recognition and avoidance of wake turbulence. So this is very, very important that we understand about those things. Safe operation, safe and efficient operation of aircraft. A private pilot must know those things. The effects of density altitude on takeoff and climb performance, you must be able to do an, a performance chart. You must be able to understand that when it gets hotter and the altitude gets higher, you're going to have less performance. Weight and balance computations, principles of aerodynamics, the principles of aerodynamics. How does the airfoil create lift? Blah, 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 blah. What makes an airplane fly? We all know that's money. Power plants and aircraft systems. Yes, you must know the principles of power plants. You must know intake, compression, power, exhaust, or suck, squeeze, bang, blow, whichever one you want to say. And you must know about aircraft systems. It doesn't require that you be a mechanic, but you must know about the aircraft systems. Number 11, stall awareness, spin entry, spins, and spin recovery techniques for the airplane and glider category. Does it say that you have to do spins it says stall awareness spin entry spins and spin recovery which means that you probably with your student need to show them a spin need to demonstrate a spin in an aircraft that is or in an airplane that is i don't want to say aircraft because that's not correct you can't spin a helicopter uh in the airplane that is approved for spins what if you're uncomfortable with it what would you do to satisfy this well why not just send them out and go to an upset recovery, upset training class? There's there, there are so incredibly many of these around. It's unbelievable. I think they have a couple in Atlanta. I went to one many, many years ago, about 20 years ago, uh, up at PDK Airport uh, with a flight school over there. Wonderful experience. I was scared of stall, scared of spins up until that point. There's even name brand people that you can go to. Here's a shameless plug for you. Right over towards, right over in Alabama, in northern Alabama, there's a guy over there. His name's Greg Kuntz. And uh, I've always wanted to go over there with Greg and to, and to do some upset recovery training with him just to be able to fly with him. He does air show stuff. He's got some really cool acts. You can look him up on YouTube. Really cool individual. Um, and I've always wanted to go over there with, with Greg and do some um do some really cool uh, upset recovery training because it's been about 20 years since I've done it. I haven't done anything like that since. So, so make sure that you teach either, you know, have your, uh, have you do it with your student or you have your student go and sit in or do some of that training if you feel uncomfortable with it. Aeronautical decision making and judgment. ADM. How do you teach ADM? Well, there's a whole entire book that's associated with it. It's called the Risk Management Handbook. Very, very thin, only about a quarter of an inch or less thin. I talked about it in my FOI lessons. But really good ADM decision. There's also some good material. Eh, it's okay in the in the P-hack. It's okay. It's not that much. But they got some some good ADM stuff in there. But, uh, you know, but ADM is such an incredibly easy thing to teach. You just got to say, okay, does this look right? No. Well, well do something to make it look right. Or did you just land short of your short field landing? Well, that's not good ADM. Didn't you know that you could add some power or that you could uh, do a go around? Well, your ADM must be very lacking. You as an instructor must teach your students that. Uh, wrapping it up here, pre-flight action that includes how to obtain information on runway links at airports of intended use. Where do we find this? What manual, what publication, or what digital source are you using? Data on takeoff and landing distances. If a person cannot do a, a takeoff or landing calculation, they definitely will not be a private pilot on, uh, or I say now, I, I'm talking about like I'm still a DPE. I'm not a DPE anymore, by the way, and uh, that's a story for another time. But anyway, if, uh, if a person came to me for a check ride when I was a DPE and they said, uh, I don't know how to do a takeoff or landing distance, you can't be a private pilot because it says it right there. Weather reports and forecast. A huge, huge, huge problem here with CFIs not teaching weather reports and forecasts. For some reason, uh, I guess the main reason is because they don't know about weather reports and forecasts. But you should be covering all of the main weather reports and forecasts with a student. Uh, the METAR, the TAF, the graphical area forecast, winds and temps aloft, both, both graphical and written. Your 12 and 24 hour significant weather prognostic charts, your radar summary, 
your uh, um, what's another one? Uh, your convective sig mats, your sig mats, your air mats, all those pi reps. Be able to read all of those particular items and know where to find them. And uh, fuel requirements. So uh, how do I know, how do I know how much fuel I'm burning or how much fuel I need for this flight? How do I do determine fuel requirements? And lastly, how to plan for alternatives if the pl if the plan flight cannot be completed or delays or encountered. So I must be able to place a scenario to you in the flight that says, oh, well, it doesn't look like we're going to be able to get there due to uh, some reason. What would you do? And the student should be able to tell me what they're going to do if the planned flight cannot be completed or delays are encountered. And so here it is, alternatives. So should your student always have an alternate in mind for private pilot? Absolutely they should. Alternates are not for IFR anymore, my peeps. You have to understand that alternates should always be planned. Always have a plan B. Always have a plan to get you out of where uh, you get yourself into. Let's go down and... Let's go down and talk about uh, flight proficiency here. Uh, we're almost done because this is very short. 107 and 109, very short because only a little bit applies. And then we're going to figure out, uh, we're going to uh, come back with another one uh, just for the private pilot um, privileges and limitations. So here we go. A person who applies for a private pilot certificate must receive and log ground and flight training from an authorized instructor on the areas of operation of this section that apply to the aircraft category and class. So right here, Bravo 1 is where we want to be because it says for an airplane category, single engine class. So this is where we want to be right here. And if you look here, this mimics exactly as the ACS is laid out. You must be familiar with pre-flight or your student must be familiar with pre-flight preparation, pre-flight procedures, airport and seaplane base operations, takeoff landings and go-arounds, performance maneuvers. And I'm not going to continue to read these. You can read these to you. I admit, I'll, I'll go ahead and finish reading them. Ground reference maneuvers, navigation, slow flight installs, basic instrument maneuvers, emergency operations, night operations, except as provided in 61110, which means you live in Alaska, and post-flight procedures. And then we go to two, and none of this uh, none of this regulation else applies to you. So 107 is a very long reg, but only from here, uh, or let's see, from, from here, just down to uh, uh, right there right there so it's not that much and it, in essence it's basically just writing out the ACS that appears in the ACS so no big deal on that so that's all of 107 there's nothing else to it you must uh, receive and log ground and flight training on those areas so you better talk about pre-flight preparation that's not necessarily an in-flight thing and pre-flight procedures so please make sure you understand the air Airport and seaplane base operations, all those particular items there are all ground areas that you must know. Okay, let's scroll on down to 109, very short here, and then we'll knock it off for today, which is going to be aeronautical knowledge for, uh, or basically the required flight time. So 61109A is what applies to us, and it doesn't matter if you're on 129 or 159, it doesn't matter, 109 is single engine uh, private pilot 129 aeronautical experience for commercial pilot and so on and so on so it says here for an airplane single engine rating except as provided in paragraph K paragraph K if we scroll down we'll actually see that it states in paragraph K that you can apply 2.5 hours of simulator time towards the hours that are required for a private pilot. So if you want to look down at K on your own accord and look at it, that's fine. But paragraph K of 109, 109K, states that you're going to put 2.5 hours in a Part 61 course towards the private pilot. So a person who applies for a private pilot certificate with an airplane category and single engine class rating must log at least 40 hours of flight time. That includes at least 20 hours of flight training from an authorized instructor and 10 hours of solo flight training in the areas of operation listed in 107 Bravo 1. So if you remember what was in Bravo 1, that's everything you've got to do in airplane single engine. And the training must include at least this. I'm going to read it down, but in the comments, I'm going to actually give you a, 
a uh, blank handout in which you can actually practice writing in the flight time. And so what do we have here? Three hours of cross-country flight training in a single-engine airplane. Oh, by the by, before I get too far ahead, I want to make sure you clearly understand that it says uh, 20 hours of flight training from an authorized instructor and 10 hours of solo flight training in the areas of operation listed in 107 Bravo 1 of this part. So there is some uh, some examiners out there who will basically tell you that you must need you, that you must have 10 hours of solo flight training. I I have been looking very feverishly for a letter of interpretation on this. Um, it's very rare that an examiner would think like that, but if you do hear it, I, I wouldn't pay too much attention to it. Um, I will actually tell you that when, when you are soloing for 10 hours, that you must do, uh, during that time that you're soloing, it's always very common for an instructor to say, well, well, what is a person going to do when they go out and go solo? Well, there is a list of things down below, but you're going to do everything that is listed in 107 Bravo 1. So everything within Bravo 1, you've got to be able to do by yourself, and you're going to need at least 10 hours of that. Now, there are some other things down below that you have to do. We'll get to it in just a minute. But of the 20 hours of flight training, the 20 hours of flight training from an authorized instructor, it says the training must include at least this. Three hours of, so this is working with an instructor. So this is all dual here. So uh, this uh, paragraph one, two, uh, three, four, all this is all dual. So one, two, three, and four is all dual. It says three hours of cross country flight training, which means with an instructor in a single engine airplane. Uh, except as provided in paragraph 110 of this part, three hours of night flight training in a single engine airplane. So if you're in Alaska where it's daytime, you're not required to meet this requirement. You would have a limitation on your uh, pilot certificate, but nonetheless, you're not required to meet this requirement. In that night portion, you got to have one cross country over 100 total distance and 10 takeoff and landings to a full stop each landing involving a flight in the traffic pattern at an airport doesn't have to have a control tower and then lastly uh, or next to last of the duel three hours of flight training in a single engine airplane on the control and maneuvering of an airplane solely by reference to instruments this is a very very important thing here on the control and maneuvering of an airplane solely by reference to instruments. So if I look in the CFI regs and I look for this phrase in the CFI regs, it actually states that I don't need to be a CFII to train these three hours because it says if you're training a person on the control and maneuvering of an airplane solely by reference to instruments, that is not instrument training, uh, that you don't have to have a CFII to do that. So of this three hours, you do not need to be a double I to do that. And that's listed in, I think it's 61195. If I'm wrong, I'll put a correction in the comments. Uh, but I think it's 61195, and I think it's the very last paragraph in there, which is like a Lima or something like that. Including straight and level flight, constant airspeed climbs and descents, turns to a heading, recovers from unusual flight attitudes, radio comms, and the use of navigation systems, facilities, and radar services appropriate to instrument flight. I'm going to actually do a specific video on how to teach this. This is, a, this is a lost art. People don't know how to teach this. You have to start off by teaching someone how to get themselves out of a cloud and then make it go from there. Just tell your student, oh, you just entered a cloud. How are we going to get out? Well, we do our timed 180 degree turn. Well, what if that doesn't work? Well, we can climb. We can descend. Uh-oh, you just got yourself into an unusual flight, flight attitude. How do we get out of that? Oh. You know, we have a radio, can't we call somebody and, well, how do we use a VOR to proceed directly to the airport? Maybe there's a VOR on the airport. Well, I I don't know. I, gotta, I guess I got to learn how to do all that stuff as a student. Yeah, so there it is right there. And lastly, of the dual time, three hours of flying training with an authorized instructor in a single engine airplane in preparation for the practical test, which must have been performed within the preceding two calendar months from the month of the test, two calendar months from the month, which basically is 90 days, up to but not including. It actually may be a little bit over. There's some you have, I guess if you have two calendar months, maybe you have two months that have 31 days and then another one that's 30 days. I guess that would be 92 days. So nonetheless, uh, the FA changes a while back. It used to say 60 days, now it says two calendar months. 
All right, so paragraph five here, and then we are done. Uh, 10 hours of solo flight time in a single engine airplane consisting of at least 10 hours of solo flight time. Notice it didn't say solo flight training, but it did up above. 10 hours of solo flight time in a single engine airplane consisting of at least five hours of solo cross country time. And one of those solo cross countries must be at least 150. Total distance, full stop landings at three points. One segment of the flight consisting of a straight line distance of more than 50 nautical miles between the takeoff and landing locations. And three takeoff and three landings to a full stop with each landing involving a flight in the traffic pattern at an airport with an operating control tower, usually done at on the cross country or something or just a, a local area flight, or maybe even you actually train at an airport that has a uh, airport uh, has an operating control tower and that's that with that. Okay, so in essence, we are finished with this one. It's about 30 minutes, but I did talk a lot uh, hopefully you're doing a lot of starting and stopping, you know, listening for 10 minutes and then going, or maybe I'm just that interesting and you just want to keep listening. Either way, I don't want the, the videos to be that long, so I'm going to go ahead and scroll down to the end of 109 here and show you what we're going to do next video. See how long it is? None of that applies to you. None of that applies to you. But there's that paragraph K there, paragraph K, and it says except it provided in paragraph K2, a maximum of 2.5 hours of training in a full flight simulator or flight training device FTD okay so that can be put towards that 2.5 hours okay and uh, let's see here uh, we don't really care about that uh, and now we're down to the night flying so the next video I'm going to talk about your night flying pilot based off small islands and I'm going to talk about the uh, privileges and limitations of a private pilot and then we'll be done with that thank you so much again for joining me I really do appreciate your you're subscribing and clicking on that little notification bell for things when they get posted, you'll get notified. Uh, I am running way behind in video content, but it really is because I work full time and I am very busy and I thought I would, would have all these videos to you, but I have just basically not told you the truth on that. But I am trying and that's what matters. Hopefully to you it does. Thank you so much for being such a loyal listener and watcher and viewer and Patreon if you're a Patreon member. I'm Todd Shannon with CFI Pro. Bye-bye.